guy and he said, like, Hello it was like and welcome back to coverage the of the World Magic Cup from so. Indianapolis. Yeah, that's My name is Marshall Suckoff. <laughs> I am joined in the booth by Zach Hill. We're going to be covering modern to start off with. This is a constructed portion. This is the sixth round of the day. Yes. It's the third round of the, the pool here, uh, of, of the, the segment. Now, Right away, we're off to the races here. We have Rug Delver on the right-hand side of your table. That's Mateus Kopech, and it looks like he's cracked a fetch land already to go get something that he can't find. <laughs> there it is. It's a breeding pool. Now, we, we don't know if it's coming in untapped tapped yet. Uh, if, it, if we see it untapped, it's going to be a Delver of Secrets. If it's not untapped, then it's just nothing. Yeah, no, and that's... Uh I think it's going to be a it's, Serum Visions. It's untapped for a Serum Visions. All right, that's the other one that he can play there. He draws a card. This is a lot like Preordain, except for that it plays out a little right. bit differently when you draw first. Right, Preordain in the opposite order, which in fact does make quite a bit of difference. It does. Now it looks like, did he shift both cards just then? Both to the bottom. And it's interesting, because he could have rebought his Serum correct. Visions, but okay. I think he realized he uh -huh. just had better things now, to do with his mana. Now we see an untapped source. Ooh, that's interesting. That's not what I expect to see. We see a Blood Crypt coming and play untapped. And I thought that we were going to see an Inquisition or a Thoughtseize, but it's actually a Faithless Looting to kick things off. Yeah, it sounds like he was uh, ready to get sure. the extra cards as soon as he can. It looks like he had retrace cards to discard. He's so. got a Worm Harvest there. Yeah, and it's crazy because yep. uh, the, the retrace cards tend to be overcosted when they're in your hand. So by discarding them to Faithless Looting, it's almost as if you just drew four cards or three cards in a land, which you're going to get back later. For a single red mana, obviously very, very powerful. Very powerful. Now, Mateus comes back, uh, he just plays a Termogoyf on his turn. It's going to get huge quick. It's already a 1-2, it's, it's actually only a 2-3 currently, and he, we're going to see an Inquisition co yep. of Kozilek <laughs> come down for Hannes. By virtue of casting that Inquisition, you almost guarantee your opponent's uh, uh, Termogoyf is going to be a little uh, bit bigger. It does, okay. and in fact it is going to get bigger because it's a creature now. He's got another Snapcaster Mage in his hand as well. Uh, and he just says, land go. <laughs> and yeah, the, the one downside to playing a deck like Karim is playing, uh, that it has, that mills itself so intensively, is that opposing Tarmogoyfs get very big very fast. Huge. Now, your Tarmogoyfs also get very big very fast, and yep. Flame Jab is very good in Tarmogoyf fights. There you go. But the fact remains that when they have one and you don't, uh -huh. you're going to start taking a lot of damage. Yep. Now, we're seeing kind of a complex interaction here. There's a Misty Reinforce. It's going to get crap for a Steam Vents here because he drew a Lightning Bolt, I believe. And if that's the case, he's also got Serum Vision, so he needs to decide if he wants to crack that fetch before the Serum Vision so that he can actually stack two cards on there that he wants to have. Right. And it looks like that's what yeah. he's going to do. Now, he can go into full aggro mode here. He can Serum Visions, fit. see what's coming. He can bolt his opponent in the face, right. which acts as four damage in this right. case. But he's not going to. Instead, he's going to play a Snapcaster Mage main phase and just going to do another Serum Visions to keep the uh, velocity rolling here. But again, he cracked his fetch you know, beforehand. Right. He's able to now do this. Now, is that a Jace Balaran we see? Wow. That, is that, that, is that like is. I, I, think, I think that's a pretty innovative uh, main deck you, card. You know who, who did that? Who's that? That's a uh, Gerard Fabiano innovation. Really? Yeah, he put that guy in there. Uh, he played that at the GP with that. And, uh, you know, he has the ability to, I, I really, I kind of follow Gerard's builds of this deck. And, sure. And, and, and copy them in a lot of yeah, ways just for when I'm playing on online. And, and you know, I, I have to say that, like, he, he'll throw some random one-ups, and I'm a little bit like, well, what is this about? It ends up being very good. Now, both cards went on the top there. Right. I think he put Island yeah. first, and then it looked like Spell Pierce. I didn't see. Mine is 16, <laughs> he's 14. Yours is 14. At least you're honest. I am. <laughs> oh, so three great. damage coming in, right, because it's creature, <laughs> land, sorcery. It's 14, 14. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 14, 14. Or 14. It's a 3, 4. It's 14, 14. But I think it's... So that's going to bring Hannah's 14, 14. 16. Okay. But Okay, and oh, sorry, then, and they are confirming, 14. like their players were saying, that it is 14-14. Okay. So it's, it's, it's amazing how when you sort of look at what Snapcaster Mage does, I mean, right there it was basically a three-man, it was like a glorified Phyrexian Razor, which is, you know, you know it not taking advantage mm -hmm. of the Flash, uh -huh. uh, you know, spending your entire third turn in Modern to cast a 2-1, and it's still unbelievably powerful. Uh -huh. You know, just ensuring you have this steady stream of threats 
uh, you know, sequencing your lands like you need to. In fact, right now, just playing defense for the Jace that's going to come down. Uh-huh. Ooh, so we see a seismic assault come down so uh, for Hannes. Now, this is a big spell because he's got four damage sitting in his hand right now. If he can draw a life from the loam, it equals six damage per activation. The thing gets out of control very quickly, and he's just going to throw two of his lands for four damage at the Goyf right now to take it off the battlefield. Now, he's out of lands in hand, so this isn't over. You know, th th it's not like... Right. It's not like Mateus can't ever put anything down again, but th this is going to put a huge dent in his plans. That said, Hannes needs to draw a life from the loan real quick. He because does. absent that, he just spent three cards to kill a Tarmogoyf. Okay. He did. And he, uh, Jace has already gotten some value, or uh, Jace is about to get and some value. So. Snapcaster Mage has already yep. gotten some value, so he's yep. way behind in the raw resource He, he drew a spell pierce. Yeah, exactly. Now, what Kopech is looking to do here is put up some pressure. Now, he's in a good spot. Ooh. Sure. This is a little bit risky. I think it's, he's in an okay life total here, but there's a lot of lightning bolts floating around, and he did, oh, in fact, draw a land. He's going to use it to kill okay. Jace, and I think you just have to bolt Bob here, right? Because you, you can't let him draw a no, bunch of no, lands. No, no, no. Yeah, you're, you're yeah. absolutely killing Bob. I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of like playing Tarmogoyf there instead of Bob. You have to expect that you're, like, all the cards that Kopech has looked at, you have to expect that he does has a burn spell by uh -huh. then. And uh, I think you want Tarmogoyf to put some pressure on Kopech and also stop the bleeding from the Snapcaster Mage. Yeah. Uh, so I don't agree with the casting of Dark Confidant at that point. All right, this is going to drop Hannes down to 10. So I'm interested in why, I mean, evidently Kopech valued the spell pierce so highly that he was able to keep an extra land. He already had a lot of lands. I think... Uh, he put a land on top, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kept, he, he kept spell pierce six. island from the, n not just now, but from the serum visions that happened That's earlier. Strange. Yeah, oh. and I, I'm, it's not clear to me why, unless he just thought that uh, having spell pierce for some of those retrace cards was, was that yeah, important, just which it might be. Amount. Bonfire of the <sighs> Dam, that is also another card Starting that Gerard had in his deck. And how much is that for, for one, two, three, four? Six. That is in fact what it is. Takes Karem down to 10 and uh, attacking with Snapcaster. And he can even man. attack now too, but Anis has yet another <sighs> land that he's drawn. This deck, off. I don't, we'll, we'll check how many lands this particular list is running, but th these will often run 28, 29 <laughs> lands, right. you know, just a just huge fun. amount. Or he says, flash this back. And now even though he's drawn a whole bunch of lands, ooh, right, you spell pierce this? I think you do. That's his whole turn. No, no, no you absolutely. You I don't actually do. don't think it's close. Yeah, you, yeah. you absolutely spell Pierce this. Spell Pierce you do that. not want him finding a life from him that beats you immediately, and it doesn't matter Eight. whether he'd have to discard Eight. it or not. Nine. Right. Nine. Five, six. Still, Karim yeah, firmly six, in the driver's seat so right now. Yep. Um, he attacks for as a, at a with a 5 6, bringing him down nine life. He Kilbich down to nine. And he says, go with no pressure. Oh, and this Liliana is going to oh, be able to strip the last card if that's what Karem wants to do. Uh, I think yeah, he's, he's holding in. Uh, I don't know what he drew, Four. but there's no reason not to attack he's got, the Tarmogoyf. He's thing. got a land. Oh, you mean you don't know yeah, what Mateus drew exactly. Yeah, right, right, right. So you just throw this thing at, at his... At his oh, sure. he's got a, a mana leak. Yep. All right, well, that's... Certainly that's better than discarding it anyway. <laughs> very good, yeah. And it's, uh, Kovic doesn't have Goyf. a whole lot of outs here. Like, you know, Go Goyf normally holds off another Goyf, but not with Seismic Assault on the table. That's right. Usually. All right, yeah, he just, uh... What won. did he just do? One, one game on uh, the he, he Was he at four left. already? Yeah, yeah, he was right, already, so he was already at four. Okay. from the last time. I thought he was targeting the Goyf for some reason. That makes more sense. Sure. All right, so he, so we have uh, Hannes Karam going up a game. Kovic just kind of ran out of gas there. He seemed to have yeah. things moving in his direction pretty good, but then he just sort of hit a wall. I think I disagree with the, the Spell Pierce and Island Keep off the Serum Visions. I, think I, I do don't too. even know how so good Spell so Pierce was. Pierce, it was really good so if <laughs> if he didn't have the, <laughs> the Seismic no Assault down sure. yet. That's, a, that's what you want to counter with it, is keep Seismic Assault off the table. That thing is wrecking ball against this. Yeah, thing. no, absolutely. Yeah. Is. That, that is the key. I think that is like the key card in the whole, uh, in the whole thing. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, turning all your lands into two damage. I mean, it wins all Tarmogoyf fights. It sometimes just straight up kills stuff. Uh, yeah, it's totally yeah. insane. All right. I think we're taking a look at Oliver Ox. This, no. <laughs> this looks like standard. Yeah, we're going to take a look at uh, standard now. <laughs> it's, uh, checking out the table right now, there is a uh, Highborn Ghoul and a Vampire Nighthawk attacking. 
Okay, and, and on the other side of the table, there's a Thrag Tusk, a Phantasmal Image, and a Birds of Paradise. So it looks like Wolf Run Blue versus Mono Black Blood Artist? Zombies? I guess it's zombies. I mean, with it's zombies with a, highborn ghoul. You're not yeah. playing highborn ghoul unless you have some sort of zombie yeah, battle that's synergy right. going on. Yeah, so it's just mono black zombies, but he happens to have vampire nighthawks in as well. Sure. So uh, normally you're in a pretty commanding position with uh, Thrag Tusk on the board, Kessig Wolf run active, but uh, you know he, he certainly can't block the highborn ghoul, and uh, he's trying to decide whether to chump the vampire nighthawk at 15 life. Yeah. On the left side we have Oliver Ox, and on the right is Adam now. You know, looking at this particular board state, you'd have to figure that Oliver's in a good spot, right? I mean, sitting at 15 life's pretty nice. Oh, and okay. I, I, what I didn't realize was it was Oliver's turn, so he wasn't decided. I was like, it can't be that hard of a chump block with Blood Con Artist. He was just deciding what to cast. One of my favorite cards. What do you hit? That, it, that I guess that's probably what he was thinking about. He, he might just plus it and go to 10, right? Points. He doesn't, he has two, four, six, he does have eight power up, but only four of it's evasive. I feel like you want to just kill the Blood Artist. I mean, that is a card, I, I'm always just terrified of that card. The Blood Artist is definitely a target that you want to do, but if you do, then your Karn just insta-dies. Uh, how does it, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, no, no, it doesn't quite insta-die. Why does it not? Because you can, oh, no, no, he I'm had to tap his, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. okay, got you. No, 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 that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he'd probably just get his hand. Sorry. Oh, wow, he's going really old school with coins <laughs> for counters here. I this think takes I, me back. I think I preferred the dice method that was suggested to him. This is not the ideal <laughs> way to track a number. <laughs> nah. Oh, okay, uh, and he's, he's using different increments of change. He might be. I uh, think so. Like, if he wants to, he can. He can. Karn goes plus four to ten on the first activation, but it looks like he's going to take out a threat okay so he exiles it so Karn goes down to three all right so yeah even if hybrid ghoul hits it it goes up to one he can plus it next turn he's got blockers for diagraph ghoul if he wants to I mean I have to think you might want to attack I, I, I don't know what the phantasmal image is copying I'm assuming it's a thrag tusk I think you just want to attack with a thrag tusk right? I think so too now which one would you attack with the phantasmal image one <laughs> or the thrag tusk one uh, it's possible oh. that uh, it's possible that Image is copying Highborn Ghoul. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> not sure. Yeah. All right. Crack reporter Rashad Miller is giving us an answer here on the <laughs> chat. <laughs> All right, we have we have con we have confirmation that it is copying Vampire Nighthawk. It's a Nighthawk, so he's got a Nighthawk and a Thrag Tusk. Hmm. So wouldn't you take out the oh. the unblockable guy? <laughs> Because you can just trade Nighthawks if you want. And then maybe. I mean, like, you I know, mean, there's a lot of points. impervious to anything here. But. I'm just not sure I understand the lack of attack of Thrag Tusk. I mean, I guess you just want to be careful. Yeah, and appreciate. like you said, you know, there uh -huh. is a Blood Artist on the table, uh, so you uh, have to respect yeah, it. Fun. But uh, I think there is a time to start playing. Yeah. Yeah, a really good way to respect a Blood Artist is to kill your opponent before <laughs> it, make, it really make gets Make it come block with it. Right. I like that plan. Cool. Now, uh, Phryxian Metamorph from Adam copying uh, the Thrag Tusk, giving him additional five life. Oh, uh, okay. All the way up to 25, our screen tells us. With a card on the table, though, you have to favor Oliver's side right now. Oh, yeah. I think uh, Oliver has a commanding lead right now. I mean, he's got uh, arguably an advantage in creatures. Kessig Wolf Run for when he wants to attack. And then Karn is just going to be able to have a field day on yeah. this board. There's I think there's only one card left for Adam, and I think that's going to go bye-bye here. Yeah, there's no terribly constructive way to threaten it. Um, make the of card. And, like, nope. Nighthawk is just embarrassing Highborn Ghoul right now. All right, so he exiles a Cavern of Souls. Right. Not too relevant a threat. Uh, Is it attack a clock with the Thrag Tusk yet? Just start tapping attack all your mana? Clock. Is it? I, I, I like getting in there. I don't know. He's got Glimmer Pose now, so he, he pads 16. his life total a little bit. I mean, can he get 16 from this point? Uh, no. It's possible, I so. right? I don't think it's likely. It, actually, and he's top decking, so yeah. I just say, uh, yeah, yeah, attack no with Nighthawk, pump it odd infinitum, and um, gain a million life. So oh, that's a plan I can take. Yay, right. we get some <laughs> dice. I, I think this is a, a much superior method. You can 
put those back in your Crown Royal bag and we'll get down to business <laughs> here. All right, so bash, you like Bash with Nighthawk, but the problem is you can't target it, right? <laughs> It'll die if you oh, try to walk. Yeah, I right. guess that's why you can't gain a million <laughs> yeah. life, because uh, Phantasm <laughs> Image has a drawback. <laughs> it does. Uh, the card it's is gonna, in English. I could have read the, it. The birds. Birds <laughs> bash. Oh, awesome. Cool. There's few things in Magic that may be happier than birds get in for a bunch of damage. <laughs> I'm serious. When yeah. I first started playing, I, I had a deck with uh, Rafika the Many. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Birds of Paradise did work. I didn't know that's when you first started playing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Comparatively recent acquisition. Oh, very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's hysterical to look at a board with Thrak Tusk and Vampire Nighthawk and the bird be the creature <laughs> the that gets into the, the red threat. zone. <laughs> They're dealing a, a massive four points of damage, yep. but uh, you got to start somewhere, you know. Yep. And, and like you said, you know, he's being very cautious. I mean, he could certainly pull the trigger and start uh, getting the beatdowns on, but, you know, is there really a compelling reason for him to do that? I don't know. I mean, he's got the board. There really isn't any reason for him to. I always feel this pressure, too. But oh, sure. <laughs> And he doesn't want to, like, let Blood Artists do anything ridiculous. I mean, right. I definitely can understand that. Just uh, extremely, extremely conservative play. It is. Even if it uh, is undoubtedly correct. All right, now the Phyrexian Metamorph copying Thrag Tusk attacks Karn Liberated. Karn currently at seven loyalty, could go down to as low as two if the Metamorph connects. On the other hand, Ox has two perfectly fine blocks in Thrag Tusk and Nighthawk, although those would give Adam uh, a 3-3 three, three to work, in, work with, as well as triggering Blood Artist several times. Which one would you block with? Uh, you know, the, the, the image is a little bit more fragile. You can make sure you get your value out yeah. of it right now by gaining life so and yeah, training it off so he doesn't like mortar pot it or something, but yeah. Thrag Tusk, eh. Gets you a dude, three. keeps the board at parity. To be honest three. with you, I, I think three. I would have just played this three. game differently. Three. Like, I don't even know if I block there. Like, if my Karn's uh, gaining me five life a turn and stripping mm -hmm. the last card out of his hand every mm -hmm. time, I think I just uh, it, battle with my birds, battle with my Thrag Tusk, and, and kill Adam in a few different attacks. Uh huh. Now we see a Dralf's Messenger uh, for Adam. That's going to, uh, you know, yep. bring him down again yeah, to 12. Okay. Now it is nice and handy it's uh, that he has Karn for Garalf's messenger. But what yeah. was this ruling that we were just hearing about? Oh, he had an iPhone for a counter and they decided not to let him use it. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's all about the bling. He's got the money. Ooh, Speaking that's of a bonfire of the damned. Wow, what a top deck. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven damage he could do. Sorry. Although there's a little bit of awkwardness because he sure would like to get rid of that messenger first. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you're going to do it anyway. Right. Right, I mean, he's going to take a lot of damage from the Blood Artist and the Messenger. He's going to take a ton. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He'll take seven here. Three, four, five. Yeah. So we are on. He takes five. Seven. He will come back, so we are on five. Yeah. No. No, All right. I, I, th th I think he goes to seven. Correct. One, two, three, four, five. More. Yeah, three games. Yeah, I think I, he, I, they're having a dispute about seven, the life total, but uh, I believe he's going to go to seven. Twenty one to five. Oh, oh, because he's at 12 and not 14. Oh, he's at 12 and not 14. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're really yeah, 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 understandable. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, going to five is not a large uh, number. I'm on five. He's especially on from a deck that might have Brimstone Volley. Oh. That is scary. Now, he is top decking, so, you know, a lot of his top decks are two twos for one that don't do anything in this situation. Yeah, exactly. Karn still a very comfortable for loyalty. Adam just took a ton of damage from the bonfire. You, know, uh, you say comfortable, more. but there is Falconrath Aristocrat uh, floating around here, right? I mean, for sure. I don't know if it would even hit Karn here or not. Well, no, I mean, I think that uh, the two life off of Vampire Nighthawk oh. is very relevant on ah, this attack. Ah, you're totally right. And right, uh, so what do we have? We have Oliver going back Adam. up to seven. I think Adam is at 16, I believe. Because a blood artist gained him a ton of life off that bonfire, even though he took yeah. damage. Yep, he's at 16. Still, so, you got to be pretty. Go. Uh, you got to be about thrilled that. about that from Ox's side. Oh, th th that was the one window that he wanted to really just lock this thing up potentially. <laughs> and it's a temporal <laughs> mastery as well. So of he's going to be hitting for right here for three, four, five. Six, seven, eight damage if he goes, if he moves in with the uh, yeah, same difference there. 
couple. Yep. Like four, seven, seven, eight, nine. Oh, one, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. Yep. So it's actually nine damage, seven, eight, nine. and that's going to be the game. Yeah, let's play another one. Yep. Nine, eighteen. All right. <laughs> Did you hear that? Let's he said, play another. Let's one. play another one. <laughs> you know, like I like playing Magic. We'll do it again. All right. So we have Oliver Ox. This is just Coptian. Take down that game. We're going to go back to the original table, which should be modern again. And, and it looks like exactly they're all ready to go. See. So we're back to modern. Which country is that? Erase everything that you just saw. We're seeing eighth edition forward, and we're seeing a pretty dynamic matchup here with Rug Delver versus Agro Loam again. So on the left side of your screen, we have, you know, a, like a. I actually never know why they call it aggro lump. All right, so we already have some decisions here. Why don't you talk us through this? All right, so uh, Inquisition of Kozilek has a lot of juicy targets that Threads of Disloyalty can hit both Tarmogoyf and Dark Confidant out of the aggro lump deck. you got to be scared of that. Uh, Tarmogoyf is probably what you take here. This matchup is all about Tarmogoyf, yeah, so I'd well, be excited to get okay. that off the table. I think That's what happens. Uh, awkward bonfire yeah, in right hand. There. Uh, we just saw Bonfire be absolutely devastating sure. in Standard. Turns out it's pretty good in Modern as well. And, oh. uh, and he does, in fact, take the Tarmogoyf. Just one. Now, uh, now in this match here, Hannes Karam is up a game. <laughs> He's on the left-hand yeah. side. He won game one with Agro Loam. I'm also told by Rashad that it's called Agro Loam because it's actually a port. It, you know, it's, it's a version of a deck from Legacy. I've actually played that one. It's It has um, Countryside Crusher, like you name Zach. It's also got Terravore in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to just make huge guys. I played and, with uh, my fair share of Terravore. Yeah. Oh, have you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a deck one time for Extended that uh, played Spectral Force, Terravore, Eight Blood Moons, and Plow Under. Look at you. Oh, yeah. Real fun <laughs> magic. Very fun magic. Plow Unders. <laughs> Not fun, per se. All right, so Faithless Looting. And he's got a big decision about you know what to pitch here. Of course, a ton of lands. I believe that's uh, what is that an Urborg? Yeah, that's exactly what that is. I think he just yeah throw away two lands. Looks like he's pitching uh, mm -hmm. Orb Orborg two you know, with Vern Catacombs. Or Catacombs. Or okay, exactly. And he's going to play a tapped Overgrown Tomb and just say go. He's going to conserve his life total here. He's got to be very considerate of how much damage he takes from his own mana. Uh, you know this is something that. You'll see sloppy players get a little bit too low. Sure. No, and he's not going to be that guy. All right, so we're going to flashback Faithless Looting. Interestingly, flashing back Faithless Looting instead, yeah. of uh, instead of casting Dark Confidant doesn't want to run it into a Spell Snare or a Bolt in all likelihood and feels like he should just dig to a life from the loam and get further ahead, mm -hmm. taking advantage of Kopech's oh. missed Lana drop. Uh, Kopech very obviously relying upon okay. that Tarmogoyf that got stripped from his hand uh -huh. uh, with no more lands and no real proactive action to take. He draws a Delver, but that Delver is uh, very, very late. It is. Ooh, uh, that's a Raven's Crime there. So, uh, Depending on, do we have a life life from the loam either in, either in the we yard? We do or not have a life from the loam yet. Okay. I think that's what that faithful looting we just saw earlier is digging to. But it hasn't quite received right. yet. Now, if we do want to dig, we can cast that dark confidant. Raven's crime can also start stripping the remainder of uh, Kovetch's hand. This should be pretty easy for him because he's got a ton of cards in hand and he can't cast a lot of them. So he's gonna yeah the bonfire. Yeah, the bonfire, is like an bonfire easy not pitch. designed to be yeah. in your hand. No, I think he's got a Blood Moon in hand. That would be a pretty nice card to hit here. Uh, cut his opponent off of green. And he's just going to recast Raven's Crime and start stripping his hand down. What do you, maybe the Threads? Oh no, he's also got a Huntmaster sure. of Hells. Yeah, that, this is definitely Gerard's uh, version of the deck, oh, yeah. by the way. I think he's just going to go for it. You know, when I'm sitting on the other side of this, this is exactly what I hope my opponent doesn't do. Right. So. That means it's usually the right play. I mean, the thing that uh, that Karem knows is that because Kovetch missed a land drop, his hand's full of spells. Mm -hmm. So anytime you can trade your land for spells, you're in a reasonably good shape. Mm -hmm. And what he wants to do is clear the way for his Dark Confidants. Get rid of the Threads of Disloyalty, get rid of the Lightning Bolts, get rid of the Spell Snares, so that the Confidants can set about doing what they do best, which is winning the game. <laughs> now, he doesn't have Triple Red. Uh, he might not have cast that Seismic Assault even if he had. Right, because uh, there aren't any more lands that he can take advantage of. Right, and there is a land there. It is, however, not an instant or a sorcery, so Delver is not going to transform this turn, but Blood Moon comes wow. down. Now, that's going to open up <laughs> <laughs> that Overgrown Tomb to actually be able to cast Seismic Assault, which is kind of exactly what Karim is hoping for, really. Getting a Seismic Assault online versus this deck <laughs> is just the death knell. <laughs> 
<laughs> and there we go. He says, thanks. I can't uh, handle this. He's stranding uh, two dark confidants. But uh, he's, yes, yeah, Seismic Assault's going to be able to kill the Delver. He's got Gopesh a ghost quarter that yeah. he's just going to pitch to kill the Delver. And he looks like he's got a pretty good hammer lock here. Now, he does have uh, Island Island oh. Mountain, though, which is pretty nice. End of turn, Vendillion End of turn, Vendillion click. click. Targeting myself. Targeting yeah. myself, uh, he course. says. Now, he almost showed him his whole hand, but he wants to get rid of this spell snare. Right. He does. He has to do reveal, have to reveal it. your whole, yeah. whole hand. No, no, no. No, you do not have to reveal your whole hand. I don't think that's the cure. They were saying you have to reveal your hand, but you don't. You do have to reveal the one that you decide. He draws a card off that and then draws a card for the turn yeah, and attacks um, first. I don't know if you looked at his hand yet. <laughs> He's like, I'm beating you down. Uh, I'm I don't definitely going to attack. Jace Bellerin. All right, so now he's starting to scratch back into this thing. He's going to get at least one card off of this. Now, do you consider plussing it? No way, right? Well, I, I no. don't think so. I don't think you want to let your opponent draw out he of did. how savagely your Blood Moon's hosing yep. him. Maybe you want to keep it uh, high loyalty to get around uh, Seismic Assault. That's right. If he draws a land, he's, he can just kill your Vendillion click anyway. Which, oh, and now oh, it's actually, instead of that, it's going to be a Flame Jab. But... Jace is out of range of lands, and he's going to be able to tick him down one, two, three times before it's going to be in range of one land. Could it be possible that he is playing to try an ultimate with Jace right now? That would be interesting. Now, J that Jace's ultimate just mills 20, right? Nearly 20 oh, yeah, cards. Nearly the 20. Uh, against a deck like Loam that spends a lot of time milling mm -hmm. itself already. Yeah. That's uh, a good point. Milling, milling them for 20 when they've been uh, dredging for three a bunch is probably, it adds up pretty quickly. Exactly. Now, Kopech actually does not have access to a green mana right now. It's, no. It doesn't actually matter given the current composition of his hand. Yeah. I could. think he has one for us. Like, getting green at this point is going to be a and very the, uh, tall click. order for him. And Tillion click. Now, what are you going to target? You will target two. Yep. And he's going to yeah, target gonna his opponent this time. Now he's got... Bob, Bob, land, land, goif. <laughs> Can't take the lands. Do you take anything here? Remember, Vendillion Click's ability right. is optional. I don't think you take anything here. He can't here. cast those things. Yeah, I don't think you want to give your opponent another draw at actually managing keep to it. cast his most oh, devastating thanks. spells. <laughs> he said, keep it. Nope. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I like the banter that they have going yeah. on here. Uh, Blood Moon is a, a very interesting car. Is that something that you see from a lot of these rug decks? Yeah. yeah, this has become a thing, especially since Jund is prevalent. It really does sure. put a nice number on Jund. And we see a Jund yeah, colored mana base here. Okay. And he says, kill it? Okay. Man, he is going to have a tough time sticking a threat. Ooh, there's a cyborg card, a Relic of Progenitus. Relic of Progenitus. <laughs> <laughs> he says, is, uh, okay. Yeah, should Karem ever end up drawing a loan? that relic would be extremely powerful. Yeah, now, Karem's got enough cards in his yards that that, that relic is going to have a hard time singleton taking cards right. out, but he can just sacrifice. Is he going to do it now? Oh, wow, uh, he's just, that's a very aggressive uh, cycle. I, I definitely understand yeah, it, though, because like, if, you, if you draw... Right, it's a mount, it's a blood moon, so he didn't need to sack it. Cute little interaction yeah, there. Yeah, so, somebody mentioned that it was a misty so rainforest that he just tapped for mountain, and he said, no, that's a mountain. Right. Uh, something interesting, you know, you, Karem, you got to be frustrated. You see the basic land in your hand, you're like, yes, basic, I can cast spells. <laughs> but it's a mountain. It's a mountain. And so he's basically forced to just hold on to it because he needs to conserve the lands in his hand long enough so that he'll have removal for, like, a Tarmogoyf right. if it comes to that. Now, at this point, Tarmogoyf would be an O one. Right, yeah. And then part, that may have been part of the reasoning behind the, uh, the, the relic activation. The other might just be... Okay, you don't have any lands in your graveyard. Uh -huh. It's going to take your loam a long time to get uh, going, okay. and I want a card mm -hmm. now because I don't have a whole, whole lot of action. Yep, and he just says, well, I'm just going to kill it right now. So Delver of Secrets hits the bin, and we, and we get this. I mean, this could be a situation where burn spells end this game, right? right? Like Lightning Bolt, you Lightning Bolt, you Snapcaster, Lightning Bolt, you. That might be the thing. Sure. Oh, I think I see a forest there uh, for Kopech. Now, I don't think he has anything green yet, but it's a tough decision because he yeah. will want to be able to cast a Goyf at some point as it's going to be one of his more resilient no, no. threats. Right. He said we both draw. Interesting. Yep. Imagine you just <laughs> play a forest Sega. Or do, or this is pretty funny. I see a, a Nile spell bomb on Hannes Karam's side of the board, so they both brought in a graveyard hate of oh, one sort sure. or another. 
I guess to, uh, against Tarmogoyf or against Snapcaster Mage. Yeah. Seem to be the it, big it, it, Yeah, it does. And, and also uh, a card that we I don't think would see out of the board or even out of the main for Kopech is, that, that does get run in this deck, though, is La Grim Lava Mancer. Oh, sure. You know, and you can kill some activations of that. I mean, that, that card isn't particularly amazing in any of those, but it's also low opportunity cost. Oh, yeah, cycles. exactly. Hey, look, another one. So he's going to activate his relic. It targets a player. It says that guy has to remove a card from his graveyard cool. from the game Exile It, and he does. Cool. Oh, okay, and, and rel now that the graveyard is a much more manageable size, the relic sitting on the table yes. is going to be able to do some value. It work. is, and he's not going to be as quick cool. to, uh, to cycle it. He says, I'm going to draw an extra card. He's got another bolt. <laughs> he's got nine damage in his hand right now. Yeah. He's hitting in for two more. That's 13. He's getting pretty close here. I was going to say, Karem's yeah, got to feel pretty comfortable at 13 life, but what he so doesn't know is that yeah. 9, I mean, he, he can die out of nowhere. He can die ab he absolutely can die in out two of attacks. Both go to the bottom there. I saw a land. I wasn't sure what the second yeah. card was, but. Uh, interestingly, Blood Moon uh, helping fix yeah. for the Lightning <laughs> in Kopech's hand. I mean, and, and really, the very game looks very bad for Karem. Yeah, th know? this Blood Moon is doing serious work. Now, that's a Vidal can Shackles, which is interestingly not that great here. Sure. The reason for it is just because he doesn't have any threats to worry about, which is obviously where you want it to be. Right, yeah. Any time that your Vidal can Shackles is bad and it's not because you don't have any islands, mm -hmm. you're probably not too upset about that situation. That's right. All right, so three mana. It's going to be for the Shackles. It's not really going to do much here, but he's left Cryptic Command mana up. That and he can true. cast it. He's got three basic islands in play. All right, so... He finally just plays out the Nile spell bomb. <sighs> yeah, can't <laughs> even pay a man with a second. Big sigh from Kovic. <laughs> that seems about standard. And he standard. draws his second shackles. Hi. Attack for two, go to nine. Now he's got the win. Oh, thanks. Uh, Is there anything yes. that he can do to interact with this? I don't uh, think so. Does he not? Is there any reason not to just do it, I guess, is what I'm asking. I I think you just have to go for it. What's Kopech your opponent is at do 19. with three red mana? Yeah, his, his opponent's, or Kopech is at 19. He can't get responded uh, life from the loam for 20. Yeah. Right? The, he can't do that so? much damage even with seven cards go. in his hand. He's got eight right now. I mean, maybe you just want to see more cards. I mean, I certainly like information is extremely valuable. Uh -huh. okay. And being able to have access to more information before you choose to end the game is, is really, really important. Is it lets you sideboard. Okay. Okay. On end step, do three to you. Oh, sure. He's going to discard. He, was, he went to discard, so this is end step and still. Three more. Uh, three damage to you. And? And, and he says, dot, dot, uh, dot, am I dead? Now I can discard finally. Now I can discard finally. Yes, you can. So sure. you're right. So what he's yep. what we're seeing here is is pretty typical of high level play. You know he doesn't feel the need Mitchell? to uh -huh. kill his opponent right away, and he's going to attack him again for two and see if he can oh, get he some more information. Okay. Um, attack you for two. Yeah, I will kill it. You go to one. He says sandwich. kill it. Yeah, I won. <laughs> okay, and he didn't show him that he had that last lightning bolt yeah. in his hand. There wasn't a huge value gained out of that, but yeah, maybe you could see an extra card no. or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't want him to, well, doesn't want him to know how many lightning bolts he left in, but does want to be mana efficient because holding up three all the time. Yep. So Mateusz Kopecz evens up the match there against Hannes Karam. They're both at one game apiece now, and uh, it looked like it wasn't Awesome for Kopech at the beginning, and then Blood Moon came down and changed all of that. <laughs> That's pretty innovative. You know, a deck with this many non-basics and, and, and really relevant green cards, including Huntmaster, including Blood Moon's pretty bold choice, but uh, apparently, as you said, it's become a pretty widespread adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that Blood Moon's one of the underrated cards, actually. Uh, Red Monkey makes unique hand-built leather accessories embodying the spirit of rock and roll. Red Monkey leather goods are designed to break in and only get better with age. For magic, they make a range of bags, belts, and cuffs featuring the mana symbols and planeswalkers. For more information, visit wizards.com slash magic merchandise. Yeah, I, I think that Blood Moon just does a lot of work in the format. Yeah. There's quite a few decks that have a really tough time with it, and it really hoses some decks. Right. Well, as we saw there, I mean, that just wasn't a game because of And he's playing red. 
Yeah, oh, sure. Like, yeah, 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 right. Enabled him to cast <laughs> let stuff. Him cast, could... na- let him cast seismic <laughs> assault, yeah. <laughs> but it still didn't, but even then, it still did <laughs> tons right. of work against him. All right. Certainly, certainly seismic assault uh, without life from the loam is not the most powerful spell. Right. And we haven't actually seen a life from the loam yet. Uh, from the modern side. All right, so it looks like we're going to be going back to standard, standard where we have um, uh, Oliver Ox was up a game. Are they tied up now? He's still up. All right, so we were holding that one, so he's still up a game. So, so Adam is up against the wall here. Uh, he needs to try to pick up a victory. All right. And uh, he does lead with a Dire Graph Ghoul, which attacks on his second turn and is probably going to cast a Skruzdag High Priest, barring something abnormal. Uh, he's tapping two mana. It looks like that is exactly what he's going to do. Now he is thinking about it, uh, whether he wants to cast Skruzdag High Priest or Highborn Ghoul. I feel like with Liliana in your hand, you probably want to get the High Priest on the table so that uh, you can set up Edicts into uh, playing another creature and making a 5-5 demon. Uh, and that is, in fact, what he does. He casts Squire with significantly better upside than a mere 2-mana 1-2. All right, so we have an update uh, from the block constructed portion of this match. Tomek Pedrakowski wins 2-0 to zero over Tavi Ludwig. So, uh, you know, so Tomek, <laughs> it, he plays for Poland, and uh, so we're starting to get down to the ramifications of these matches as Tomek has given his team the advantage, and uh, if either Kopech or Adam can, can take it out. Now, we're going to focus on this match for now, and if he loses, then it's going to all come back down uh, to the last one of the Now, certainly, uh, Skurzdag High Priest not getting the most effective beat down ever on attacking for one a turn, but Liliana, very, very powerful in this matchup. Uh, the Wolf Run ramp deck really needs to piece together a critical mass of both lands and spells, which requires a lot of just raw cards. Mm -hmm. And anytime Liliana can chip away at one component of that, Plan, the Wolf Run deck's cards are just very unlikely to come together in the way that it needs. Because you can't have both. You can't you right. can't spend a bunch of, of resources mm -hmm. making land drops and then accelerating your mana and still have something to ramp into by the end of that if you're exactly. using a card every time. Yeah, other, sometimes you can be like, okay, well, whatever, I'm going to throw away my top end threats and I'll just keep the, okay. the land I need, the spell I need to cast next turn, and I can empty my hand. Mm -hmm. The uh, Wolf Run deck can't empty its hand of its spells because they all cost so much. Right. It can't throw away its lands because then it won't cast its spells. And if it throws away its top end in favor of its lands, it only plays four Primeval Titan and like three Frost Titan. Yep. And so each one of those threats is hugely important. Yeah. So Liliana, exactly what you want to be doing on the third turn of the game against a deck uh, like the one Oliver is playing. Now, and if he can just dump his hand of creatures and just keep plussing Liliana, like he can get pretty right. hasty with it. We see he's got a decision here where he's got a higher, a highborn ghoul and a diagraph ghoul. He can play both, but then if he plusses Liliana, he loses his go for the throw. Is right. that the play? I mean, he's probably thinking about saving go for the throat for the primeval titan or something, but I mean, if you get to that point in the game, are you just dead anyway? Uh, it's hard for me to tell. Uh, I mean, I definitely think that like, Go for the throat is not that important if you have a Liliana with a zillion counters on it, ready to edict any one of the threats that exactly. the Wolf Run deck plays. Exactly. So I think you just dump your hand and uh, and and yeah, just Apply activate Liliana. Pressure. I mean, he's got Oliver on the ropes here. He's at 15. Actually, he's at 12. And yeah, I mean, he's got him pinned down pretty good. If he can if he can dump a bunch of guys on the board, that would be quite good. I mean, right. So he did the the he he is doing that. It looks like they have both discarded. Now one card he has to consider here though is Whip Flare, right? That is absolutely right. Like if he just commits all of his guys to the board, it does apply maximum pressure, like we were talking about, but it also gives him maximum exposure. What might be the play <laughs> is just to four for one. Right? Yeah, exactly. What might be the the play is to play one more creature to keep your high priest open, uh, but nope. it turns out no, he does not do that. <laughs> Moving in. I think he feels like if Oliver had Whip Flare, he would have cast it already. What that's he, probably reasonable. What he does have to be scared of, though, is the bonfire that's coming out in one more turn. Yeah, and it looks like we're going to see rampant growth 
I mean, at this point, Oliver can even consider, as long as he doesn't die to it, he can consider just slamming Primeval Titan the next turn and go get two well, Glimmer Posts and try to up, right? then get two sure. more, gain eight, and uh, try to, you know, grind back yeah, that way. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess Liliana's going to take it off the table anyway, so that's probably not Same. the best plan. I do know that Oliver has a Thrag Tusk in hand, which is something right. that he'd be pretty interested in having as well, although right. I think if he Thrag Tusk, we'll be seeing a demon shortly after. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, the, the thing about, uh, yeah, you mentioned Liliana a second ago, which is why we'd definitely be seeing a demon uh, sooner rather than later. Exactly. Him holding his threats in his hand isn't going to do anything if his plan is, is to activate Liliana. If you want to activate Liliana in this situation, because she's one away from her ultimate, and the Wolfron deck needs a critical mass of lands to operate. So uh, I feel like you tick Liliana up and ultimate her as soon as you can. Just blow up three lands, call Three or four day. lands go away, and uh, he's never going to come back. I mean, he needs, like, multiple whip flares to come back. Right. So. And uh, he doesn't have a lot of time to draw those whip flares. No, because he just took seven damage, dropping him down to five. He's got, like, a turn. And, uh, wow, uh, with a blood artist Is that artist a blood there, artist? Yeah. Oh, blood artist off the top is, cons is absolutely brutal. That's going to completely change Oliver's options because, yeah, he's just going to pitch the... Primeval Titan, because now all of a sudden the bonfire doesn't do anything. Right, if he bonfires him for five, he dies. Yeah, he's just exactly. Dead. It would have been so sweet too, because he was going to get the bonfire, redirect over to Liliana, and just do oh, some it was going to be so work. powerful. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Blood Artist is one of the reasons the decks like these work. You know, between the Blood Artist and Garoff's Messenger, they can deal a lot of direct damage very quickly. Yeah, and and it really does protect you against sweepers. Now. We know that he didn't have it in hand at the time. You know, it was a pretty fortunate rip. But again, yeah. that's why it's in the deck, right? No, yeah, I mean, exactly. that's the big, that's the point of the thing. All right, so Adam is now even this matchup as well. So we've got some pretty close stuff going on here. Uh, one and one, one and one for both the standard and modern portions of this. And you say Tomek Petrikowski has won the block match already. He has, Two yeah. Two to zero. Two to zero, yep. Hey, yeah. Uh, Looks like we're uh, going back to modern now. Players are ready to play. They have drawn their opening hands. All right. Looks like uh, looks like uh, Hans is or Hannes is, is more than willing to keep. We see a lava claw reaches on turn An one. An untapped Nashville island and then say go. That usually is a spell snare, but it can also be a spell pierce. Also, it can just be nothing. Right. Yeah, it can just mean that I didn't draw a Delver or a Serum Visions, and that is very unfortunate for me. Now, do you do you play around either one of the one-mana counters here, or do you just jam out your threat and make them show it to you? I mean, it, if I have a Tarmogoyf, I probably just play it out, because there's really no point in the game, unless you have, like, an Inquisition or something, right. where you're going to be able to get around a Spell Snare anyway, and you don't care, care about Spell Pierce. Right. Um, Life from the Loam, obviously you just run it in there. Who cares? And it is a Life from the <laughs> right. Loam. They countered. Great. Yeah, yeah. More power You did it. you, you got to be positive that, yeah, you're, that's going to resolve. You're going to get a land back, and now you can get to dredging. Yep. So this is the first time on the weekend we're going to see actual dredging happen. Now, <laughs> how does this work? Like, is he going to dredge immediately? Do you just want to get that loan back and just doing it for, like, one land? Or are you going to do other stuff and then dredge later? My gut, having played a fair number of these uh, these kinds of decks, is that you try to do your other stuff first. You really want to dredge back life from the loan uh, when you can cast it to immediately get back three lands using retrace cards. I mean, it does draw you three cards if all you want to get is more lands in the graveyard. So if you have no more lands, uh, dredging it tends to be a very good call. Uh -huh. It also puts more retrace cards in your graveyard. That said, right now, he doesn't have a lot of things to do with those lands. He can mill them, of course, for retrace, but he doesn't have the mana to capitalize. I don't know. Well, I expected him not to do it. Jumping right in, is. but you'll see he, he just got two lands right in there. Or no, that's a Maelstrom Pulse, isn't it? Right. Yeah, that's a Maelstrom yeah, Pulse. But Maelstrom one Pulse. land went in, and he's got a fetch land, so he'll have two in the yard to get back if that's what he wants to do. Sure. This is a very slow start for Kopech. Like, he's got to be pretty worried. Unless he sideboarded pretty drastically, uh, this could get pretty bad for him. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, he is yeah. drawing three cards a turn. His deck is designed to take advantage of loaming as soon as possible. No, no, to put I'm talking about Kopech. Oh, you're talking about Kopech? Yeah. Like, he needs oh, to be sorry. swinging no. for three right here. Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. And Kopech's uh, start doesn't really do anything. I don't know about this keep. I mean, it doesn't really... 
it's got a lot of ways to deal with Karem's creatures, but one of the things about this loam deck, you know, games one and two were very much about dark confidants, very much about creatures. This game, he might not even cast a creature. Yeah. Right, he might just keep dredging until he gets enough flame jabs and raven's crimes that it's not a game anymore. And the more and more I think about it, the more dredging just seems correct. You want to get a raven's crime in the yard as soon as you can uh -huh. and just start casting those over and over again. Punish Kopech for his slow start and just demolish his hand. Yep. Now, Kopech did has a charm of Goy Fear. I did see that he also drew a blood moon, but it's kind of bad because he needed to get the Goyf down first to make that work. Also, um, you know, Hannes Karam is very astute, and you can see the first land he fetched was actually just a forest. A basic forest. Yeah, he's going to get those because he has this engine going with the loam where he can go grab any basics he needs, you know, get a swamp and a forest before he gets messed around with anything else. And he has a basic swamp in his hand as well. So what he does his deck should be turned on there. Yes, and it sounds like he needs to hit some retrace spells off that life from the loam bridge for sure. Uh, what he doesn't have right now, it seems like, is a viable answer to that Tarmogoyf, which is very big thanks to Seismic Assault and all the dredging that's been happening. Yeah, because because Seismic Assault is an enchantment, which often you don't see an enchantment in the yard. It's kind of one of those, one, you know, like instant sorcery creature land. You see those all the time. Right. Like Goyf is a 4-5 in a lot of matchups. But if an artifact or an enchantment or a planeswalker or God forbid something tribal yeah. <laughs> gets in there, then all of a sudden the, the Goyf can get really big. Yes. So uh, he's thinking very, very hard about what he wants to do with his fourth land drop. Which land is going to maximize uh, the returns on his uh, retrace spells over the long game? Uh, you know, which land he's least likely to want to discard to something like Seismic Assault? And it's we okay. see just life it's in the loam after life in the loam. Graven Cairns into life and loam. He's going to keep doing it. Uh, Tarmogoyf uh, just got to be getting in there. Yep. Uh, and that a is a Scalding Tarn. He's going to crack it. Probably just going to grab an island with it. If he does, that's going to turn on his, um, his uh, Cryptic Command. Right. Which is going to be pretty key, like, in, in, in case Karim does pick up, like, I mean, he's got two seismic assaults in the yard already, but if he picks up another one, you know, that's a card that you want to keep off the table. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything that interacts with Karma, but, I mean, you know, Karim's deck does run trouble. That's true. Uh, it just kills, you know, kills Goyce. I mean, that's one of the, the main reasons Paul's you run it. one of them's in the graveyard. Truth. Pick four? I mean, it definitely has. Well, I mean, it certainly has plenty of ways to deal with the Tomboy if, if it needs to. It just, again, doesn't have access to them right now. So that was four damage off of land sorcery creature enchantment for the Tomboy. And he just says, go again. Now, Hannes Karam should probably know that. He's looking for the upside. We have a judge call. You can sit this. And he's, he's just requested that his teammates be sitting instead of standing just because he doesn't want him to get a, a good angle looking at his head. Sure. This is just being careful. You know, he's, this, this isn't like a wild accusation. He's just saying, hey, maybe it would be better if you Yeah, I mean, right. You might see something, and that's yeah. all downside for me. So why would I let you do that? Right. It's just well within his rights. It's, it's just a, a big drama or anything like that. Now, now, if you look at it from Hans Karam's side, I mean... He passes with that. Are you thinking cryptic? Are you thinking maybe he's just got like bulls with Vendillion click? A lot of the spells that he has are played on your turn. That's the thing. I, yeah, like I don't know that you play around anything specific. I just think you know that he has something, uh -huh. and you try to adapt around that. I mean, you can't very well not cast spells. I think he's trying to figure out right now whether to dredge life for the loam, like whether the retrace spells are going to help him, or whether he needs to just draw an actual answer to Tarmogoyf. On the other hand, I think, I think you right. have to dredge here because your hand's full of lands, and shot. like you only get one shot for a, a, an lands. answer yeah. if if you don't do Sorry. that. Now he's been doing a lot of dredging. The deck is usually designed to take advantage of that, but he really just has not hit anything. He just hasn't hit anything. You know, one of the synergies of the deck that maybe isn't apparent if you've never played it is that dredging you know, puts three cards into the yard when you dredge life from the loam, and the cards in the yard are the ones that the deck uses to win the game a lot of the time. So, yeah, he's going to have to find some action here pretty quick. That lava pot reaches just isn't going to get it done. No. Uh, with a couple more lands in play, it might. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he doesn't know, obviously, about the lightning bolt, although he has to expect has something to expect. with a grip flow of cards. Yes, six cards in hand for, uh, 
Yeah, so I Boy, believe he's actually yeah. passed the turn and that Kopech is, is discussing Boy, with his teammates what if he wants to do anything on end step. He doesn't want to open himself up to getting terminated, so I think he's just going to do nothing. It never feels good to not use your mana like that, but, you know... I mean, certainly, yeah, if you have Tarmogoyf and your opponent's not doing anything, yeah, there's no... Art, you know, you Are don't you have gonna, to just he gonna make bolt him, him now? do anything. I think he's going to bolt him right now, because it, it represents yeah. four damage. Yeah, no, you're yeah. absolutely right. Three to you. So... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he also wants to bait that. I mean, before damage, after we block. After we didn't block. He says, okay, oh. so this is what's happening. He, wanted, he said before Paper, damage, so but after blocks were not declared. So 11, and now take 5, down to 6. So yep. he's going to do 5 damage to him with the Goyf, and 3 yep. damage with the Bull. That's 8 damage swing, and things are looking pretty good. He's got another Lightning Bolt in hand, plus Cryptic Command backup. I think that's I think another Light from the Wolf from Karim. So I think that Kopech is in okay. position to win this game. Yeah, a I lot mean. of pressure on Karim here to come up with something. He's got one chump block available, potentially. Oh, he found his own Tarmogoyf. I thought that that was Good a life life That is a Tarmogoyf. Uh, we're we're, we're going to see a cryptic command on the Tarmogoyf, uh, you know. He says okay, end of turn sacrifice. but end of turn sacrifice. And do you, you just bounce it and draw a card? Or do you just do, what do you do? Uh, maybe you, he's going to cast a pavilion click. I don't I know, know. I'm kind of confused. I guess he, no, no, no. I, he, I, he don't want to cryptic command that Tarmogoyf because it's possible he has a terminate. But if you're going to sack that land, then you're clearly not respecting terminate. No. Because your spell pierce yes. doesn't counter it. No. Nope. Because uh, he has two mana open. Yeah. And, so. and right now, it, when the land is sacrificed, there's this window with that trigger yeah, on the sack where did. he's only got access to three mana. Right. So the terminate can come in there and get it. but. Either he's assuming that his opponent doesn't know that, or he's just saying, I don't care about him. But he's just going to be doing like an end step, and then he's going to bolt him. That's what's going to happen here, because he's setting up lethal in the air. Yeah, and that makes sense. He's keep everything. It's all lands and life from the loams. He's being studious here and writing everything down. Lightning bolt you? Lightning bolt you. And then he's going to take his turn, and he's going to swing with that click, and that's going to be it. And the hand gets extended. Kopech says, Kopech says, see, I told you. And you see some hand, some fist pumps and some laughter. They're very happy because that's going to do it. Kopech 2-1 over Hannes Karam. And uh, combine that with the fact that Tomek Pedrakowski also won his block, uh, his block match versus Tavi Ludwig. And that means that they, that, um, yeah, back to the booth. Yes. Hey, welcome Morgan. back. I'm Marshall Cycliffe. That's Zach Hill. And it looks like Poland is, in fact, advancing here. Uh, at least, I think they're actually just advancing. I, I didn't yeah. see what their, what their other one was, but they certainly won this one. Uh, they beat a pretty tough Estonian team. They've come Very here. Very good Estonian team. Yeah, and really, uh, you know, shown their stuff. They had a high ranking coming in. And uh, Tomek Petrikowski and Mateusz Kopecz take it down. We didn't even see the last match. You know, Adam, he, Adam, uh, Bubach, he also could have got in there and won. So, you know, that was, sure. a, you know, those last two matches, one or the other could have gone uh, towards Poland and they could have taken it down. Yeah, I mean, we really, uh, it, it was interesting watching the Loam deck because at no point did it ever really get off the ground. No. You know, the first two games, we didn't even see a life from the Loam. Mm -hmm. And then in the third game, it, it was dredging, <laughs> dredging, and dredging. And, well, and, and it never found anything. Yeah. You know, no retrace cards, no faithless lootings. Right. Really, no seismic assault in his hand to take advantage of all those lands. And, you know, sometimes I guess you just look at nine cards and, and that's not going to be enough. Yeah, you know, we I was talking about that earlier the the old ver the legacy version and this one as well they run 26 27 right. 28 lands sometimes right. because with uh, dark confidants and with this you just actually want a ton of lands but sometimes that comes back to bite you well yep that's exactly okay. right so we're going to send it back to the news desk now that was a sweet one i, I really like this uh, triple format it keeps us busy bouncing <laughs> around but let's go back to the news desk and uh yeah get an update on what's going on out there in the field All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the news desk. Rich Hagen, Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall, and a cast of thousands coming your way over the next few minutes as we wrap up the final round. We're going to get straight to it, and the first gentleman we're going to invite to the end of our desk 
uh, over here is Mr. Blake Rasmussen. Come in, Blake. Uh, come and join us um, as we widen out the field. Uh, so, uh, Blake, you're part of our text coverage team, of course. Um, and this round, you've been looking at the match between uh, the Philippines yes. and Finland. So, yes. uh, how did that go, um, and what can you tell us about that? Well, it was an interesting match because uh, they came in basically winning in. Uh, Finland had 18 points coming in, mm -hmm. while well, the Philippines had nine, but the Philippines was the higher seed, an eight over a nine. And then you had Croatia kind of lurking in the background as the top seed, yep. also at nine points. So it was do or die for both teams. And uh, what happened was uh, Finland, uh, Finland dropped out to an early lead. Yep. Uh, their block deck, uh, Max Schlobum, was playing uh, the blue, white, red Miracles deck. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, and he was playing against Jund, and he took the first game pretty quickly uh, mm -hmm. on the back of a number of Miracles. Uh, but then he kind of watched his, his teammates run into some trouble. There was a Delver mirror on the other side of the table. Seen some of those. Yeah. Yeah. Seen a lot of those, absolutely. The decks looked almost identical. Restoration, Angels, Geist of St. Traff, the whole deal. Um, and uh, the Philippines just drew better. Game one, they just drew better. It was a hard-fought match. Uh, it came down to one player having one life, one having three. Wow. And a flip Delver gave him just enough to get through. Okay. Um, and then in the center match, uh, Modern, we had Doran uh, versus... Uh, Hello. Yeah, Doran <laughs> versus uh, Rug Delver. Yep. And again, it was a back-and-forth match. A lot of removal traded on both sides. Um, Vettelkin Shackles came in and nearly stole the game for the fin Finnish team. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, eventually, too much removal, too many uh, Knights of the Reliquary broke through. Uh, and then while uh, the, uh, the block match was getting through game two, uh, unfortunately, both of the uh, Finnish players lost uh, in, in pretty quick fashion. Okay, so we have a win for the Philippines mm -hmm. and a loss for Finland. Yes. So my map takes both of them to 18. Yes. So now it kind of depends what's going on with Croatia. All right, well, thank Absolutely. you very much, Blake. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that update. And uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find out more about that match uh, as the weekend goes on. Um, we're going to invite Tim Willoughby in now uh, in to join us. Uh, Tim, again, part of the text coverage team. Um, Tim, where have you been uh, well, for the last 60 minutes? What do you got for us? I've been by the Croatia match. And okay. in principle, it could have been quite a sort of straightforward simple one Portugal not in a position where they can make the make the top eight mm -hmm. but it was very clear that they still wanted to battle they still really wanted to show that they could perform with their constructed decks and actually Portugal had some of the more interesting constructed decks of of any of the teams that I've watched today in the constructed portion okay what did they have so in the uh, standard slot you had Marcio Cavallo playing he had um, the zombies deck mm -hmm. very aggressive deck against poison so that's a matchup where Either way round, it can go up very fast, and actually, that was the match that got completed very quickly indeed. Uh, the first game for Croatia, not a great deal happened for them. They didn't quite get the draws they needed. Marcio just piled straight in there and got the damage in that he needed. And then really, after sideboarding, he was the one that had just so much removal that Croatia could never really get started. So very quickly indeed, Portugal went one match up, only needing one more match to secure the series. Um, the other two decks that Portugal had, um, over in the modern, they were Affinity, so again, a very explosive deck. Robots. Uh, <laughs> but potentially one that's sort of great in game one, not so good in the, in the subsequent games. Mm -hmm. And then in the, uh, in the block, they had the uh, Angel of... Uh, Angel of Glory's Rise? That's the one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which... With, with Faithless Looting, you can set up a really big turn with Unburial Rights, and that's exactly what happened in Game 1. Um, so actually, the games won, Game 1s for Portugal were very, very strong, very fast, and they went 3-0 up in the series in games before Croatia had scored any points at all on the board. Hmm. It's pretty clear at this point, by the way, that uh, people are all over Croatia, are sort of, uh, in Finland, are praying desperately for this Portugal story to end happily, because if Portugal beat Croatia, that will mean Finland get in on their 18 points. But if Croatia turn it around, well, Croatia then gets a leapfrog, both Finland and the Philippines, on 18 points, right. and Finland will get knocked out. Virtual so, being the top seed. so where does it go from here? Does it carry on with well, going the way of Portugal? I mean, both the decks that were, were left for Portugal, those sorts of decks that if you've got the right sideboard plan against them, there's quite a bit that you can do. Okay. So we saw that in the, uh, in the block match, 
um, Graft Digger's Cage, Pillar of Flame. There are lots of really nice answer cards for the, <laughs> for the Croatian team to, to really take a bit of the sting out of the combo sort of play that the, um, the Portuguese could manage. And actually, Grigor Petric Meritic, who was playing in the, um, in the block match, he very, very quickly assembled a Wolf versus Silverheart or two and was Ooh. able to just roll over Portugal before they could really get started. Okay. Um, the match against Affinity, we had uh, Croatia with kind of a, a rug, next level blue sort of thing going on. Mm -hmm. And they did manage to pull things back a little bit. Um, turns out that if you can stem the early beats with um, ancient grudges, you can really just sort of gradually grind people down and, yeah. and get them out. And that's exactly what happened in game two. Wow. Okay. So we all of a sudden we had two matches that were going to the rubber game, and uh -huh. if Croatia could win both of them, then they could win the the overall series. Yep. Um, and in essence, there were lots and lots of sort of haymaker plays going on in the in the modern match, which is what we've seen actually in quite a lot of the modern matches today. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it was the combination of Wolf vs Silverheart again, but this time with Falconrath Aristocrat to finally edge things out because Falconrath Aristocrat. Aristocrat, the one creature that wasn't going to get killed by a blasphemous act and ultimately wasn't one that was going to be able to be easily answered by Portugal. Um, so the final match of the day for today for Croatia was Affinity versus the Rug matchup. And again, it was the Ancient Grudges that really wow. sealed the deal. Yeah, Ancient Grudge really doesn't like Affinity. No. This just in. Who knew? So. Croatia, thanks Tim very much. Great Thank to you. have you on the show. Uh, and thanks for your sterling work on the text coverage. Croatia win there. And that means that Croatia, Philippines and Finland all finish on 18 points. But EDM, Croatia are through to the top eight. And let's be honest, I think if Croatia had not made the top eight, we would have been really disappointed it would have been, on the it would strength been quite of quite disappointing, days. especially they were, they were the top seed coming into today's action. Yeah. All right. Let's see what else we've got and who else we've got. Well, it turns out that some people, when they're not being directors of R&D, they used to be journalists at magicthegathering.com back in the day. Coach! Uh, here right. is <laughs> Mr. Aaron Forsyth. We like to call him Coach. We like to call him Coach. All right. Pittsburgh's finest. Come on, then. I what was, have you got I for was us? looking forward to tomorrow's action, so I was watching the... Uh Chinese Taipei versus Hungary. Oh, match right. So this is a match where they're already through, seed right? Seed matters, as you've been saying all day. Uh -huh. And it continues to matter very much tomorrow because the, the best seed gets to choose play draw for all three matches they're in wow. <laughs> in the top eight. Oh. So you want to, you want, they didn't, they could have both ID'd and gone and got something to eat, but instead, no, they need to play because the more points they can mm -hmm. accumulate today, the better chance they have of choosing play draw. Yep. So I was watching the standard uh, match the most uh, between. Uh, Yang and Gliad, they're both playing zombie decks. Right. The board was very complicated, very intricate. There's mortar pods on both sides. There's Geralt's messengers. There's Thrag Tusk. They're throwing stuff at each other. There's blood artists. Da da da. da. Ended up not. They didn't even get through a game. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh uh, yeah. Tu Ching Kuo, who I've been you know just impressed with beyond compare. Yeah, he's this a weekend, really, really uh, well-class player. And who player. knocked the U.S. out by beating Alex Binnick in Modern last round. Sure. And by knocking... <laughs> and, and, yeah, and by knocking on top of his countryman's bonfire. deck to bonfire Brian Kibler. Uh, he, so he's playing a kind of blue-white mid-range, almost control deck in Modern with a ton of man lands. It's got muta vaults, it's got celestial colonnades and some counters and kitchen sinks and whatnot. He beat Binnick, who was playing the kind of red-white-blue Geist of St. Traft bolt deck that seems very popular in modern right now and uh, his opponent uh, Coesis was playing this, the same deck but he couldn't he couldn't repeat he got beat 2-0 pretty badly and in the meanwhile uh, in the kind of block Jundi mirror that was going on uh, Chinese Taipei lost that very quickly as oh, well wow. so Hungary they put the smack down and made a statement here for tomorrow. A, beating a Chinese proper Taipei. beating. So yep. that, that's Hungary safely in, Chinese Taipei safely in. Thank you very much to Aaron Forsyth, director of R&D, who got to watch maybe a preview of a replay tomorrow. Who knows? We may see that in the top eight. Uh, we have one more person on the way for us. Uh, that'll be Sheldon Menery coming shortly um, to uh, a screen near you. Um, but BDM, we're closing in on knowing the full top eight then we need to go work out the seedings. You will see the seedings and the quarterfinal pairings right here before we leave this show. All right, so we're probably only five, ten minutes away uh, from that. Um, psychologically, how much difference, forget the points, 
How much psychological difference does it make? You're both in for Sunday, tomorrow's another day. Or is it a big deal that Hungary goes... It's a, it's, a, it, it's a big deal. They did it with fair die rolls. And, you know, put a beating on them. And now they're like, you know, it's got to be in Chinese Taipei's head that tomorrow they're going to be on the draw in all of these same matchups that they just lost. You know, uh, should they play them? Or, you know, and that Hungary's got to feel great going in. They just beat really what's been the most impressive team that we've seen on day two, mm -hmm. the, the team from Chinese Taipei. They've just been yep. uh, very impressive. Everyone's just come around. It's like, it's like suddenly people are realizing uh, who Quo is. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, this, is, this is a player who's just been putting up result after result after result, uh, you know, putting up, you know, racking up strong pro point finishes each year. And, you know, here this is kind of his, uh, you know, debutante. Uh, if Chinese Taipei win tomorrow, do you think we will see a headline on magicthegathering.com that says no. status quo? No. You don't think we will? I don't think we will. I don't know. I think that may be a temptation even Greg Collins can't resist. All right. So Hungary through, Chinese Taipei through. It sounds to me like we have all four standings. So oh, let's wow. look at the four pools for you and see exactly what we've got. We'll reveal the top eight, and then as soon as we can, we'll show you the full bracket. So first of all, pool one, there you go. It was a three-way split. Oh, dagger for Finland. Sherblum, Hegfist not quite there. They went two and won, 18 points. So did the Philippines, but so did Croatia. Portugal, they were one and two this morning. They really can't complain. Um, you know, they had a good run and they got to play all day on day two. And yeah, and Kudasem, they could, have, they could have rolled over in that last round yeah. very easily. And they were like, no, came to play. So congratulations to Croatia and the Philippines. They are into your top eight. Let's take a look at pool number two. Well, this one, we have Chinese Taipei, two and one, 18 points. This is your kind of straight stacked downward. United States, one and two. Uruguay, 0 oh and three. Hungary, three and 0. Oh. I talked to the Hungarians before Doing this round. Way. Yeah, yeah, but I talked to the Hungarians before the, the round, um, and they said, so you know that if we win this next round, we'll be six and 0 oh on day two? Oh, wow. Hungary have not dropped a round today, so Huge, huge congratulations, Gabor Coxis, Tamas Nag, Tamas Gliad, uh, and Ensemble Cast. Uh, they're a great nation, a proud nation. They haven't got a great history in the game. Couple of Grand Prix top eights, but now they're writing well, a Nog new is chapter. We've seen, we've seen do well. Absolutely. I mean, he, you know, he's um, very much been around uh, at world level. Uh, played in some team events before. Now uh, Nag uh, is here in his fourth team appearance. Coxis again, fourth team. Uh, appearance and Maddy Shrek uh, also has pro points, as does Thomas Gliad, who, as he said, overall he was uh, 12 and 1 this weekend. Only one loss for Gliad that was against Scotland. Thought I they, they've, they've never in. finished better than 10th in uh, team competition. No, uh, that's right, and uh, that's way, way back like 2001. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, Zolt Tokali and Lazar Sabo and Michael Durham, you have someone that are going to be, you are now eclipsed. Yes. Because you're into the top eight. Congratulations to them. Let's look at pool number three. Scotland are in at two and one. Estonia, oh, they came so close, one and two. Poland, three nil. I think they are a massive danger tomorrow. Oh, I absolutely. said at the start of the weekend, I think the Poles are really on the money. I, I, Slovenia, I mean, 03. Mateusz yeah. Kopek has just been a terminator. I mean, he's just been he's just been steadfast, straight ahead, no nonsense. You know, you talked about his technical play earlier in the weekend, and he's just been demolishing his opponents. So, uh, I, I would be very scared sit, sitting across from them on Sunday. Okay, so that's three. Let's take a look at the final pool. So the last result that came in was in fact a draw. And I, as far as I can tell, that was an absolutely God's honest draw. <laughs> but let's find out more about that because we're going to bring Sheldon Menery in to tell us about, because he's our newly appointed ambassador to Puerto Rico. Uh, so Sheldon, you, you were following the Puerto Ricans this yep. round. Tell us what went on. First two matches were savage uh, matchups. The modern matchup, um, 
Jorge Airmain playing robots against Rug Delver didn't really have a chance. Okay. Uh, that, that was over relatively quickly. On the other side, Cesar Soto uh, against uh, Philip Vallis. I'm sorry, that was the that was the um, oh, sorry, that was so, the robots so, match. Cesar Soto, so, yeah. Um, Puerto Rico wins the other match, and it's early. It's they're they're done early. Yurkovich and uh, Gabriel Nieves Ortiz are playing White Blue Delver and Esper Control. Oh. Game one. What a super electrifying, <laughs> high-paced aggro match that is. So game one, uh, game one goes until the 23-minute point right. or so. Uh huh. And meanwhile, no, now we know we know from the scenario that Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, is winning in. But if they lose, they still need help from France because they're the low seed in the pool. They would sure. be three, two, and ones sure. that are only three. France relatively quickly dispatches their match. Okay, so they like beat I said, Ukraine. Yeah, they beat Ukraine. Like I said, I knew those. I know those French guys. They came to play. They mm -hmm. weren't going to roll over. Yeah, in that recurring last round. theme this this, yep. this Saturday. We came to game absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So half an hour ago, the Puerto Ricans are in, and they don't know it. <laughs> they keep playing. Uh, oh yeah. Slovak Republic. Slovak Republic is in. And they don't know it. Wow. With a, with a draw. Wow. So they keep playing. The game grinds down, grinds down, goes to the third game, grinds down, grinds down. Extra. There's extra time in the match. Then there's extra turns. When they draw, the Puerto Ricans had found out minutes before that the French had lost. Okay. There was a fair amount of celebration at the end of the game that was the draw from the from the Puerto Rican. They had a sort of an effusive celebration. Slovak Republic, big sigh of relief. Yes. Because they because they were out with the draw. If if oh, wow. if France doesn't win, sure. yeah. if France doesn't and win, they they need, two and they're didn't out with know. the draw. Right. So here, I mean Slovak Republic is one is one of the he more heavily favored teams coming into this event. So they're facing elimination. Big, big, big monkey off their back, getting that draw, getting in, getting to Sunday. Okay, thank you so much to Sheldon. Let's wow. take a look again at Pool 4 then. In the light of that, let's see what we've got for you. That last pool featuring the Slovak Republic, France, Ukraine, and Puerto Rico. Let's see if we can get that up again for you, just to confirm. There you see Slovak Republic 1-1-1 one, one, and one with their 12 points. France 1-2. and two, doing Slovak Republic, as it turned out, a favor, defeating Ukraine. Ukraine, no disgrace at all. Congratulations uh, to Alexander Onosov and teammates uh, making it through this far, but the top 16 is the end of their run. And Puerto Rico uh, is 2-0-1. All right, so Brian David Marshall, let's see if we've um, got this right. I think we have an idea of the top eight. What is less clear is where they're all going to play. So let's talk how, a bit about how they're going to reseed. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the top eight. We're going to see the Philippines there. We're going to see Croatia there. We're going to see Chinese Taipei. We're going to see Hungary. That comes out of pool two. We're going to see Scotland. We're going to see Poland from group three. And we're going to see the Slovak Republic and Puerto Rico from group four. Just talk a little about your initial impressions of the top eight lineup and what we might see tomorrow before you know all the matchups and sure. all that. Sure, I mean, my, my, my uh, couple, couple things come to mind. First is oh, Chinese wow. Taipei and Scotland have been juggernauts. They've been juggernauts throughout this and just plowed their way in through their, through their pods, right? Like, just been, been phenomenal, although a little bit of a hiccup at the end for Chinese Taipei as far as their match with Hungary. Croatia and the Slovak Republic, well, they kind of limped across the finish line. You know, mm -hmm. that that's they were they were early favorites. Uh, they were both in great position, and that position continually eroded. People were closing the gap on them throughout the day, but they made it across the finish line of time. Very amazing, very, very impressive. Uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, the two stories that impress me the most really here are 
Puerto Rico and the Philippines, two, two small countries that do not have a you know, noble you know, history of success at mm -hmm. international magic competition. And uh, you know, I'm just like, I'm so happy for both of those teams getting through. The Philippines, it's a little bit of a, they almost were not here. Their team, right? it's, it's, it's not, this? It's, you know, it's expensive even with your airfare being covered to come to a magic tournament from around the world. And, you know, they were like, you know, even with our airfare covered, I don't think we can afford to go. And they were at, at, on the brink of not coming here. Uh, local store owner, uh, there's a store in the Philippines called Neutral Grounds. Not happy about it, but that it's there. sounds remarkably similar <laughs> to a famous about New it. York but it's a, it's, a, it's a famous store. It's, it's a bastion of the Philippine magic community. Right, okay. Um, paid for their hotel, gave them a per diem for food, oh. and made sure that they could get here to represent the Philippines. And for them to reward that generosity with this kind of performance is really what this whole tournament's about to me. Well, amongst the brilliant news for the Philippines, I will share with you the slightly less exciting news. That between now and tomorrow morning, Brian David Marshall and I will not be learning Tagalog, so you will not get the live stream in Tagalog. However, apparently, you all speak pretty good English, so you can tune in to us. We'll do some English for you uh, on the commentary tomorrow. Do you know anything in Tagalog? You know I've not made that up, right? No, no, <laughs> no, I do. I do. Thing. <laughs> I do know it's an actual thing. Uh, I, I do actually know a couple of words in Tagalog. But you can't they say them They are absolutely <laughs> not fit for this webcast. Fantastic. Is there any end to your talents? <laughs> yeah, There's probably. certain phrases you just need to know in every language. That's, that's very true. Um, an element of changing of the guard um, to bring things closer to, to my home and I'll, I'll just back and forth with you. Sure. The backdrop is Europe. Name strong magic nations historically. We'll alternate. Off you go. Germany. The Netherlands. France. The Czech Republic. Finland. The Swedes. Norway. Sure. Going back in the, right back yep. in the day. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and in recent past, in terms of pro presence, sure, sure. Belgium. Sure. Belgium, okay. Czechoslovakia. Right. So, of the top eight here, six are Europeans. Wow. We haven't mentioned any of them in what we've just said. Oh, France, absolutely. France, no. Germany, no. Netherlands, no. Mm -mm. And you look and you go, Croatia? Not a huge presence on the Grand Prix scene. Hungary, not many of them travel to Grand Prix. You get a few at every one. We hope to see more. Scotland, yep, there's always one or two who travel in hope with the, the GB contingent around Europe. Um, but again, it's a small community. Poland, equally, we've seen them start to bubble up. I mean, sure, you know, absolutely. it's, it's we, no surprise to see them here. Well, you, you and I are not shocked no. to see Poland no, in, no, any, no. in any way. Not no. shocked to see Croatia here. No. And not shocked to see the Slovak Republic here. Oh, uh, no, I mean, Slovak Republic, they were, I, I, think, I think the phrase we used in the column we, we did together on magicthegathering.com a couple of weeks ago, we said, can't be sure that they're going to win the thing, but it would be a real shock not to see them there on Sunday giving it another go. Right, absolutely. Um, and, that, and that certainly held true. So we have the six European nations and then two from further afield, the Philippines we just talked about, and again, Puerto Rico, you can't give them enough credit. Oh, just just phenomenal job. The, the thing I, th I think is tricky for some people to, to understand, I was, I was asking a lot of people, because we're, we're very excited, both you and I, about uh, the Team GP at San Jose. Yes. And one of the reasons we're so excited, um, oh, I believe it's actually five European nations, isn't it? Croatia, Hungary, Scotland, Poland, Slovak Republic. Yeah, of course, that's right. Chinese Taipei, Philippines, uh, um, Puerto Rico. I can't count. What can sure. you do? And, and again, um, but no surprise to see Chinese Taipei there. Uh, no, Su Ching Kuo and an assembled cast of no, excellence. No. I, I, did a, I did an interview with a number of uh, national champions, and I very much wanted Su Ching Kuo 
to be a part of that. Yeah, I, we weren't able to work out the logistics, but I mean, he's someone that we were certainly paying attention to coming into this event, and you know, he's opened a lot of eyes here this weekend. People are like, "Wow, did you watch that Su Chin Kuo play?" It's like, yeah, he's really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but in team events, one yeah. of the things that excites people is the idea of having super teams. You can see three of the greatest players playing together. We know, for example, uh, that Paul Chion will be playing with Louis Scott Vargas, who's their third wheel, Paolo Vita Dama de Rosa. Okay. <laughs> Average at yeah. best. Um, Paul, Paul Chion's the weak link in that team? Apparently. <laughs> Maybe it's LSV. I don't know. No, but depends whether he's concentrating. Sure. Depends, you know, sure. depends on what life's doing to him elsewhere. But in that scenario, the reason that the big names like team play is that if they're playing robots and they're playing against 19 ancient grudges on the other side, they're just going to lose because it doesn't matter how good you are at magic. If the matchup is sufficiently against you and the cards are sufficiently against you as they get drawn, you will lose. Which is, of course, the appeal for the rest of us. We know that we've got a shot. We can beat Kaibota once. Maybe. Maybe I, not. I never beat him. Uh, I've never played him. Lucky you for playing him. Um, but pros love teams because even if that happens to you, the two others in the team, you need much more variance sure. to, to kick you out of the door. So given that, that this is a team event, for the likes of Puerto Rico to not just, you know, get a bit lucky here and there, have a favorable matchup here and there, make a right decision that matters for a game here and there, they have to do that across three and four seats for days at a time. So nobody who is in tomorrow can, can be looked at and say, ah, you must have been lucky to get there, because you really earn it in teams. You really earn it. I believe, I'm gonna ask for, okay, we are uh, just a couple of minutes away from knowing the seeding. They are backstage right now with the rabbits on the hamster wheel of doom, plugging it all in, and we will reveal the quarterfinal matchups. Um, so, Let's just check once more backstage. How are we going? Do we have it? Not yet, they say. I will ask you blind, therefore. Yes, sir. To pick a winner. Without knowing the seeds. Yeah. I am. Who going would you? To pick. Who do you think is favoured of this eight? I, I like Chinese Taipei. I can see that. I can see, though, that the Slovak Republic have been here before. They have Absolutely. Team World Championship rings, as it were, yeah. on the shelf only 24 months ago. Uh, I can honestly see them repeating. That said, my near countrymen from Scotland, I had a chat with them. Um, and, and I've been known periodically to have a word with people getting into the top eight. You know, partly as congratulations, but also to sort of say, look, these things don't come around yeah. very often. Sometimes they go by don't very fast. Don't blow it, kid, you tell them. <laughs> not, not even don't blow it, kid, but really more treasure it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because it can go really quickly because you, uh, you know, and it's best two out of three, and maybe you're the match that goes O2 quickly, or you don't even get to play your third game. It's or, the same thing I, I tell friends of mine who are younger who are getting married. I say, at your wedding, Taste your food. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Right, taste your food. Take some time. You're here. This is a huge day. You've put a lot of time and energy into it. Um, you know, take a moment, look around, go, wow, I'm here. I, the view from here yeah, is pretty this spectacular. Is, this is spectacular. Look at all the teams on the sidelines. Look at all the teams doing like side drafts and you know trying to change their plane reservations maybe to get home a day early. I think I'm. I, today, I am better than all of these teams. Yeah. And what the Scots were saying is that when you look at it, there were some huge teams with, you know, two big names. Let's face it, there were some teams with four. You look at the Belgians, they were four straight up God's Honest Magic pros. I mean, I think look at the team from the Slovak Republic. Yep. But given the choice between facing the Slovak Republic or someone like America. Sure. 
I think you take the Slovak Republic. And the Scots were saying, everyone clearly deserves to be there, but we could have been in a top eight that was, let us say, USA, Japan, the Slovak Republic, Jelga Vigosma plus the Netherlands, Rafael Levy plus France, one outlier, Scotland and Australia, let's say, something like that. They said, this top eight doesn't look like that. This top eight, everyone goes to bed, scared of nobody, respecting everybody, sure, and, and just feeling that all they have to do is what they've done for the first two days, which was get up, play good magic round after round until somebody makes them stop. And I think that's, in a way, one of the, bi the biggest stories coming tomorrow is that there are eight teams, partly because it is teams, rather than individual, where there's always someone who goes, I've got the bad matchup. And, and some, sometimes the, the, the sum is greater than the parts. For sure. I am going to go, I gotta live with You really them. want to go Scotland, don't you? Look, well, I don't, I don't have to tip them. Tell you what, you go Scotland, I'll go Puerto Rico. <laughs> no, it's fine. I will tip the Slovak Republic, because I do genuinely think they will win. It will not surprise you to learn that who I want to win is, of course, my good friends from Scotland. And we'll, we will just see what tomorrow brings. I gotta tell you, I'm gonna be happy with almost, I, honestly, I, I, you know, I, I've, I've been so enamored of watching all these different communities play Magic. I've really grown to, uh, you know, care about the Philippine team, the Croatian team, the, the Chinese Taipei team. I, I'm excited for all of these squads. So I, I have no, this is unusual, I have no rooting interest in, in this topic. I just, I'm really rooting for Magic tomorrow. Well, I think you're going to get your wish, and right now we've got our wish. It is time to reveal the quarterfinal matchups for the inaugural World Magic Cup here at Gen Con 2012. So, here comes the bracket. We will begin at the top of the bracket. Here comes your number one seed. It is Croatia. They have dominated the field. Three, the three finest players Croatia has ever produced. I would like to revise my pick, Richard. <laughs> oh, oh, like that is it. Hey. I, I am picking Croatia. Could that possibly be something to do with no yes. dice? Yeah. <laughs> Did, ha, listen, I don't want to leave this weekend without having mentioned that seeding is really important. <laughs> do, do you think I've done? You're, you're all right there? All right. Who did Croatia play in the first quarter final of the World Magic Cup? It's the eighth seed, and it is Puerto Rico. Wow. Puerto Rico, you keep doing it the hard way. You were the bottom seed coming in in that last set of constructed right, pool play. They were play. in 16th place, yep. and now they're in eighth. And they were 24th coming into the day. Right. So, quarterfinal one is set. It will be Croatia against Puerto Rico. Let us take you back to the board where everything really counts. The second quarterfinal. Who will be the first name out of the bag? Here it comes. It's Poland. Kuchnevich, Bubac, Kobech, and Pedrakowski. That is their squad. And they will face, here it comes, the Philippines. All the peas together. Poland against the Philippines. Gerald Kamangan and friends. Zach Azaki, he began with 39 cards in his deck against Vincent Lemoyne, got dispatched in five minutes, 2-0. Has it gone better since round one? I think it has, Philippines. Just a little bit. So the winner, as you can see from the bracket, the, willin, the winner of Croatia, Puerto Rico, will face the winner of Poland, Philippines in our first semi-final. And now, the bottom half of the bracket. It begins with Chinese Taipei. Wow. So, Su Ching Kuo begins at the bottom of the bracket. He cannot play Poland, can't play the Philippines until the final. That's the earliest he can meet them. Let's go back. Who do Chinese Taipei play in their quarterfinal? It is that is, that is a mouth-watering That tie. is a heavyweight bout. That. <laughs> Wowie. The Slovak Republic, Yurkovich, Flock. Surab and Vallis, 17 team appearances between them, and that leaves seven and eight, 
Let's see who we've got. We have the pride of Scotland, the number two seed. I don't care if they don't win a game tomorrow. The number two seed that is very impressive. is a wonderful performance by Andy Morrison and the boys. Well done, congratulations. And finally, our seventh seed, you know who it is by now. Here it comes. It is Hungary, who did not drop a game on day two. So let's stay with the bracket. Croatia against Puerto Rico. Poland against the Philippines. Chinese Taipei against the Slovak Republic. And Scotland against Hungary. Worth, worth noting that Hungary put a beating on Chinese Taipei. Could be a semi-final. But it did not affect their relative positions to each other. <laughs> okay, so that is the bracket. Listen, thank you so much for being with us all day long today, all day long yesterday. We know you have joined us in your hundreds of thousands from every country in the world, and we really do thank you for it. Tomorrow, we thought we might do this all again with those eight teams who can go to bed tonight dreaming of being the first World Magic Cup champions. You see our Twitter accounts down there below our names? Yep. Tell, tell us who you think is going to win. Who's tell us win who you're rooting for. And why. Maybe you know something about some of the players that we haven't talked about that are on these teams. Absolutely. Give MCG us some information. Rich, top eight games. Tomorrow, 8.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is when we will get this show on the road. Don't you dare be late. It's prime time in Europe. Sunday afternoon. Kick back, relax with the best the world of magic has to offer. This has been day two of the World Magic Cup. Tomorrow, day three it's Super Sunday. For Brian David Marshall, the Pro Tour historian, until we meet again tomorrow, on behalf of everyone here at magicthegathering.com, I'm your host, Richard Hagen, saying bye.